Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode number 133 for Monday, September 25th, 2017. <laughs> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by for and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, Paul Kent. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. I had a busy weekend. I had a trio gig, a band gig, and a solo gig. Oh, wow. Huh? No yeah. kidding. Yeah. Huh. All good. Uh, good. The, yeah. The, um, the trio gig was Friday night. Nice, easy restaurant gig. The band gig was Saturday night. And that was a, that was a pretty heavy thing. You know, I've been talking about how... Uh, my great drummer for 15 years is going to be stepping down. So I hadn't actually seen him for a couple months and we oh. drove up together. It was great to catch up. And then we played the gig and the gig was an absolute gas. I mean, it was, it was emotional. We honored him in a very, I think appropriate way. Yep. Uh, we had a lot of laughs and then uh, we drove back together. And so I got home about two thirty, two forty five oh, yeah. in the morning and had to leave at 11 the next morning for, uh, and I was also am, so I couldn't fall right asleep. Of course. And right. And then I had to leave for, uh, a, a, a noon 1230 winery solo gig. And I was a, I pushed really hard on Saturday cause it just, the, the energy was flowing. Sure. And so I was a little paying for that. It took a little while for the, for the winery gig to ease in, to settle in, but it was do a very, do you drink a lot of water in those scenarios? Like, I mean, I find that's like, if I don't do that, I can't sing two days in a row. Are you asking if I drink a lot of water during the band gig? Well, just in general, to try I drink and maintain a lot of water your hydration. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. I find I have to drink tons extra on gig days and, and even the day afterwards, just to even get close to being able to sing again, you know, ton of water. Yeah. It just, it takes me a little while to wake up in general and it takes me my voice a little while to kind of, so kind of about midway through, I guess midway through the gig yep. is what it started to feel about, about right. So that's good. Well, that's good. Yeah. At, least it, at least it got better during the gig and not worse. <laughs> yeah. And again, I, I just was reflecting Sunday night about, about all this music, you know, I've had so been so fortunate and I just really enjoy everybody I play with. I just, you know, love what I do. Yeah. And I love, you know, that almost just about every gig. I don't think that, I don't think I've done a gig anywhere for quite a while where at least not a couple of friends, you know, go out of their way to come see me, which is that's really, good. That's that is really, really, really rewarding. And so I'm just a little bit in that bliss, in that bliss, bliss state right now. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's how, I mean, that's why we do what we do. That's for oh, uh, sure. Yeah, man. Yeah. I had, um, I'm trying to think I had a, a few gigs last week. I had, uh, at least one, maybe two with Amanda. They all start to blur together, man. Uh, yeah. I played that's Monday night, um, with, uh, oh, right. So I played Monday night with Amanda, at uh, uh, outdoors, it was actually awesome. It it was raining in the afternoon, and they should have canceled this gig, but uh, but they didn't. And we were kind of bummed that they didn't. I was like, who wants to like be outside? Even though we're under a cover, it's like nobody's going to be there. Or whatever. Well, it turns out, even though it was drizzling a little bit, everybody else in Portsmouth had closed down and canceled all their gigs. So this was the only place happening, and the place just filled up, and it was a we had a really fun time, and uh, so that worked out. And then Thursday night, I, um, I I got a call from a friend of mine who is um, he's now the director of education, music education at the Rochester Performance and Arts Center, which is a, a new thing here in Rochester, New Hampshire. It just opened up. They they sort of refurbished this old building and they're doing all kinds of great stuff there. They're going to have lessons and and they've got a little performance space and this was their grand opening on Thursday night. And he said, man, you know, I'm trying to put together a, a band to play. Would you, you know, would you do it? I'm like, of course, no problem. It's like, great. There's drums there. You know, no worries. I'm like, okay. So I, you know, I threw like cymbals or whatever in the car just so I'd have like cymbals, a snare drum, like the things drummers bring. This would actually be a good thing. Like if you tell drummer, I was thinking about you. If you tell, <laughs> if you tell drummers, you don't have to bring anything. Like when I auditioned with Uptown, you know, Gary said, don't bring anything. We have everything covered for you. Well, I, I left everything in my car because I didn't want to be a jerk, like walking in the door with stuff. But I had cymbals, a snare drum, a kick pedal and a throne. 
right? Because those things can be a disaster if they're wrong. Um, yeah. So that that could be your, you know, a litmus test for drummers, like how well prepared you people. People laugh at me a lot because I, I always have like, you know, an extra cable or an extra this. And and, uh, you know, it's I'm a I'm a I'm a recovering Boy Scout. Right. So yeah, I'm yeah. always prepared. And uh, I, I feel like, you know, as a musician. So that would be a good litmus test. Like, you know, ask people, all right, before you leave, let me know. What did you bring in your car? You know. <laughs> What's, what's still sitting out there that That's you didn't know you need, right? That's a great idea. Yeah, because then you you kind of know, like, how does this person think? Um, but anyway, so I, I left all that stuff in there. I went in and and uh, started playing. And we played uh, for probably about an hour, hour and a half. But we didn't have anything prepped except he's like, oh, no, everybody that's playing is like top quality players. It's like, that's cool. And then he texts us all, you know, the morning of the gig. And he says, hey, uh. You think you can hang with with his Toto tune? Dave's gone skiing, and I'm like, I've I've heard that song before. Like, isn't that isn't that in like I don't? It's it's counted weird, and it is. It's this crazy syncopated. The, the, <laughs> the head of the tune is this crazy syncopated thing, and so I I I went through and kind of dug through it, and I'm like, okay, I see how it is. It's it's four measures of four. And one measure of two that then repeats three times. And then it goes into this seven, eight section. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I kind of learned it. And I'm thinking, is everybody else going to be like, what kind of people are these? Like, who, who, are, who are we playing with? And uh, yeah, it was awesome. And it worked. Like everybody learned it. And we, I mean, we, it wasn't perfect, but it was way closer to perfect than it was to disaster. And uh and the cool part was I talked to the keyboard player. I'm like, yeah, here's how I'm counting it. And he's like, oh, he says, I'm counting it nine, eight. He's like, it's four measures of nine, eight. I'm like, well, 36, eight notes. Get there any way you want. You know, <laughs> that, that's fine. I said, the end of it doesn't feel like the feel of the of the turnaround is definitely for me was, was like in four. Like, I can't count that in nine, eight and, and lock it in. Like, but that doesn't matter. Like, we're all good. You know, the fact that we're having this conversation means we're going to be all right. You know, we're all thinking the right way. Right, right. And uh, it was a pleasure. You know, it's it's I've never had the opportunity to play that kind of music out before. And we didn't play much of it, but we, you know, we jammed a little bit on a few things. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a lot like the stuff I've mentioned when I go down to Connecticut. I, I play with some old friends where we used to play stuff like that all the time and, and we get together and do it. But it was interesting playing music like that on stage in front of people that were like really into it and really appreciative. Um, so that was that was cool. It was uh it was fun to, you know, have to challenge. And it, it was interesting because throughout the 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 gig, like I didn't know these guys. In fact, I had it, it just the way it worked out. I wound up playing music with the keyboard player before I ever had a, a like a verbal conversation with him. And uh, and in the middle of the gig, like at first, I'm like, oh, man, like these guys can play. I got to step up my game to be able to. Hang. <laughs> And then I, and then I realized, oh, wait a minute. Like he's feeling that way right now. And now, okay. He's feeling that way. It's like, all right. So it, like none of us were on stage at, at, at any point in time thinking I'm the best musician here. All of us at different times were thinking I'm definitely the worst musician here, you know, <laughs> which, um, which was great, you know, and everybody was real supportive and, and, and it was good. So, so that was fun. And then, uh, and then I went and saw, I played a gig Saturday night. We had a, uh, a wedding gig uh, that was actually a ton of fun up at uh, up at this place called Castle in the Clouds. So it was a good. Did you play there before? No, I've never even been there before. It's a kind of a New Hampshire landmark and a really pretty vista up in the in the mountains. And you just get hired, or was it like a, a yeah? There was a relationship between the band and the no, no. Married? This was this was a uptown celebration gig. So we were just hired and. Um, and we went, but it was, yeah, it was a good gig. Pay, obviously paid really well, like weddings do. And, um, what yeah, is, uh, great. what is the, what is the ballpark pay scale for weddings back there? Um, so we, as a band, I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here. Well, I, 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 it's a weird question, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, it's anywhere. I've played weddings here. That one I think was about, was like a $4,000 wedding. I walked out of there yeah. with more than 500 bucks, right? I've played quote unquote cheap weddings for like two grand. And then I've played some that are more in the like five or six range. So four is probably, 
you know, average, maybe, maybe the low side of average. I mean, we, it was a pretty easy night for us. We didn't have to do a lot of crazy things. So, yeah. you know, that the extras is where it, you know, turns into a $10,000 thing real fast. But uh, what are extras? Oh, you know, if they request a lot of different songs or, ah. you know, if they want lights or if they want, you know, well, we did uh, some of the guys did some cocktail music or whatever. But, you know, like if, if it and if it turns out to be you know, a, an all day thing, or if it's just the evening, you know, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I'd say that's about ballpark for what we are out here. Yes. Um, you know, uh, there's a friends and family rate, you know, so sure. if someone close to the band is getting married, it's a little less than that right around there. Sounds about right. Top I've heard is 10 grand for, a, for a wedding mm-hmm. around here. Top band, you know, kind of a show and, yeah. you know, that whole type of thing. So yeah. I guess it's about the same. That is about the same. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 about the same. You, you know, it's it's and I love it um, with this uptown band. And I know a lot of guys, guys listen. So I have to be careful um, about this next thing that I want to ask you about. Um, I love this, that the leader of this band, when he pays us for each gig, he goes through and he builds a spreadsheet, right? And he goes through all the expenses for the gig. You know, here's what the 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 rate that we got was, and here's the breakdown for everybody. And he takes, uh, you know, he takes a, a percentage as a booking fee, and he pays people for gas based on how far they have to go from their wow. homes. And all, oh, it's but it's all transparent. Like there's there's not a dollar you can't account for, which is just, I mean, it's great. But I'd also be fine doing these gigs if he said, "Hey, we have a wedding." And, uh, you know, everybody for this one gets, uh, 500 bucks and that's it. Be like, okay. I mean, as long as I'm okay with whatever the number is, like, I'll take it. Like, you know, and if he winds up with an, with two grand, because, uh, you know, that's how he worked it. That's, that's also okay with me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But in the breakdown and I've seen other bands do this. And in fact, I've even been in other bands that do this. There's, uh, you know, we pay our, our sound engineer as a member of the band, right? Uh-huh. Which is, to- you know, I, I would do that all day, all day long. Um, and then we also pay a PA rental fee, which again, it, and I want to make it clear, I'm not actually complaining about this, but it, you know, I, I like to overthink everything. Huh. And so I sit here and I scratch my head and I'm like, well, why don't we pay the bass player a bass and bass amp rental fee? And why don't we pay the drummer, a, you know, a drum set rental fee? Like the band is using everything that's there. And, uh, and I've always won- I've always wondered about this because I've been in some bands where the, you do a PA rental fee and I've been in some where you don't. And I, I don't know. It like, I, I, I don't know. What do you, what do you think about it? Um, I think the musician, the professional is supposed to provide his own tools. So I think that that's, that's why. I don't sure. go with you on the, on well, but, the, but you know, we're the paying, musicians, but we're paying the sound man a, a share equal to a musician. Uh, yeah. I, but who owns the PA? Let's assume the sound guy owns the PA, just like the bass player owns his amp and the drummer owns his stuff. Let's, I mean, let's assume, I think it's actually a yeah. little more complex than that, but, but for the sake of this discussion, you, you know, yeah. So, um, it just seems to be an accepted thing. And I, you know, I like to challenge the, uh, challenge the status quo. Yeah. So I thought it'd be a good conversation to have. At least so, you know, fair market value on getting a sound company in, right. Yep. Versus, versus the value of having an in-house. So I've bought a PA and upgraded a PA and invested in a PA. Oh, me too. Over time, I, I right? own, yeah. A good chunk of the fling PA. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Um, so let me back up here. So, um, as a leader, I um, just say gig booked and here's what the pay for it is. Sure. In general, it's about, you know, the 10 guys in the band plus Bill. And now lately, Bill has some helpers for loadout, that type of stuff. Yep. And so in general, it's roughly about, you know, a, a one twelfth share per man. OK. Yeah, fair enough. There, yeah. I try really hard to have a minimum and not pay the guys under minimum. And there are gigs where um, I don't take anything for myself or I take a little bit less. Okay. Uh, but um, I, that it comes out in the wash. And so, you know, I also pay for the web hosting and I also pay, you know, when I think the band needs advertising to support a certain gig and all these types of things. So 
in general, that comes out when we get a big money gig. You know, I'll pay myself out for that type of stuff. Sure. But 90 percent of the gigs is just a or not 90, 80 percent of the gigs is about a fair. I don't charge the band for the PA. Um, uh, but if I need to buy something for the band, um, you know, for this PA, um, you know, I may, you know, like I say, only when big money gigs come around. So the club gates are easy. They're straight ahead. Yeah. And most of the privates and casuals are, are equal shares, but the business stuff has to come out in the wash. I never charge for my time, but, um, uh, you know, and there's also gigs where, you know, they're particularly bad load in or load out and bill needs an extra, you know, hand. So there's, you know, two oh. guys in the crew instead of one guy in the crew. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, just kind of that. So my, yeah, I guess but my to answer be, is to be fair, you're, you're conflating both the management efforts and, and expenses and the PA expenses here. Right. And I, I think it, it and I'm, and I'm, I, I think it's important to separate those. Right. I mean, I realize in your band, you can't because it's, it's one guy, right? Well, I'm, I'm answering the question about, about pay and transparency and those types of things. Yeah, sure. And so my answer is when I book a gig, I just tell the guys, this gig is booked and here's what it is. Yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, I, I leave myself some, some room to make some subjective decisions about expenses. Like I said, if a, if a gig is coming up and I think we need to support it with a couple hundred dollars of Facebook advertising, I do that. And I charge it back to the band after that gig. Sure. So, so that's the way I do that. Sure. Um, but I don't, I don't write a, a, a complete expense accounting for every gig, mm. nor would I want to do that and go to the time of something like that. So, so there's a little bit of subjectiveness, but I think, you know, the guys know I don't take a full share for myself on gigs. that don't pay that much. And, you know, it, 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 I think there's a, a certain trust factor there, but it's not a partnership. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting, I wonder why he provides so much um, transparency, you know, as opposed to here's the gig and here's the money. Right. Well, and, and the way I look at it is, I mean, I knew all of this going in, like that we have a dedicated sound man and, and here's how we pay him and we pay a PA rental fee. And he takes Gary, the, the leader of the band, takes a, uh, a, a cut on any gig that's more than two grand. He takes it's like a 5% cut or something like that to, to pay for not only his time in, in sure. putting the gig together, but you know, like you said, all these sort of ancillary expenses that, that come up the website, the phone calls, whatever. And, and that was all, you know, a hundred percent clear up front. So this is like, yeah, fine. No problem. And, and again, yeah. the, the, the net that I get out of these gigs is, is plenty of money. Uh, I'm not worried about it, but it's just like this concept of of PA rental on top of it just seemed weird to me. Like, why do we separate that out? I have no problem. And I don't even have a problem with this because I knew it going in. It's just I think a, it's fair it's to separate it out thing. Because, because the because most bands don't have a PA and it's an expense of doing business is that you have to bring a mm -hmm. PA. Right. And most venues that require you to bring a PA, that's a business opportunity. So it is, I, I do think that that makes sense that it's the PA is, is a separate thing. But that's what uh, I'm saying. If we're paying the sound person as a member of the band, why is the PA different? That's the part I'm just like, there's you, you have not given me an answer for that because you know, what's the PA worth? Maybe, uh, you know, somewhere between five and 10 grand, right? Well, yeah. easily the guitar player's rig could be worth that easily a drum set and, you know, all of the assorted symbols and hardware and all of that stuff could be worth that. Right. And anybody's rig, a keyboard player's rig, like, you know, you get three keyboards in there and suddenly you're, you know, you might be tilting past 10 grand. So yeah. I, I just, I, it, and I, it, I guess the question I'm asking is why, why is this, PA rental, a normal, because I've seen it time and time again. It's just like, oh yeah, you know, you got to pay the, the somebody. I think it's because most, I think most sound engineers, most for higher sound engineers don't come with a PA. And so, and if they uh, did, you'd pay, you'd pay that. I mean, I think, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. the nature of that labor is that, you know, these are, you know, these are workers mm -hmm. and not asset holders. And, right. and I think that that's more an industry norm. So yeah, that's maybe that's why it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, if, if I think of like the ten people I would call if I needed a PA, if I needed sound, yes, I could think of I can think of eight that are just sound engineers that'll yeah. walk in and mix you, uh, and I can think of two that have sound companies and you right. know you pay your yeah. problem. You, you might pay the sound guy X and sound guy plus gear, 
you know, you'd play, you'd pay why. So yeah. you know, yeah, that they, makes I, sense. I think, you know, if you were to go back to your leader and say, uh, I'm going to charge you for my, for my drum, my, kit. my drum rents. That's what I need to do is just like, I like get your answer. <laughs> I, yeah. Well, I know what my answer would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. But, but still like, you know, it like, that's what, that's what we need to do as musicians. We need to change the narrative here so that, Oh no, I'm, I just, I'm hired to play. I'm hired to play the bass. I assumed you had one. You just right. wanted me to play your bass for you. Oh, you want me to bring a bass? Oh, well that costs extra. You know, I don't know. That's, I mean, it's interesting when you. Good luck with that. Well, but it, that's not a, uh, that's not an odd scenario at all for a touring musician, right? When, when you get booked to go on the road uh, uh, it, at the, at, at certain levels, it's like, okay. And then let me know what gear you need and we'll make sure, you know, we have that. And, uh, and it's either at the gig, you know, renting locally at, in each town, or if we're doing enough dates and they're spread out enough and we're going to have a truck, great. We'll, you know, we'll get your stuff and, you know, we'll put it on the truck and then, and then that's that. But is it often, I mean, again, you're getting to a level of, uh, of resources that are a little bit different. But, but most, I mean, uptown, musicians... uptown's resources are way different than say flings in terms of just what the band does. Right. Yeah, but I mean, again, it's, it's a different thing. Most musicians have a personal connection to their sound and their tools yeah. um, a little bit different than, than us, than a sound engineer would. So I, I think your, your interest in, in uh, equating the two scenarios, I don't think they're, I don't think they're equated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, okay. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It seems, it seems odd to me. It just, but that's cause I like to overthink things. Yeah. True. You yeah. do. I you do. have one of those brains. I love it. Yeah. 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 So and it's not going to change. Stuff it's not going to change anything with the band. I'm, I'm fine with the way it is. It's just, yeah. it's just one you of need, those things. It's like you need to have the conversation. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why did this become a thing? And I think you, you, you hit on it, right. That, that there's the industry norms. It is an industry norm, despite the fact that it, doesn't actually make sense on paper. So, yeah, at least not to me. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, you, like, Dave. you like how I'm spinning the narrative there, Paul, trying to put words in your mouth without actually yeah, putting words I, in your I, mouth. I know exactly. I've, I've known you a long time and uh, <laughs> this is a tactic. It, it's, you know, I didn't even think about it. I just sort of like, it's, <laughs> oh, it's, we'll, we'll just put a little wrapper on this conversation. <laughs> and I you notice it as it's coming out. Yeah. You could be a politician. Oh, I, yeah, except I, I'm the problem with, with that is I'm willing to actually speak my mind and, uh, and people don't generally like to hear that. So, you know, I, I want to tell people what, what actually is the case, not what they want to hear. And so that would make me a bad politician in practice. I was a politician on Sunday. Were you? Yeah. I had a solo acoustic gig and. I had to play the song Rocket Man because it's been in the news so much. Got to smile on people. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Hey. All right. So what else do we have now, Mr. Kent? You want to talk? You said you wanted to talk uh, about in-ears. You want to talk about in-ears? Uh-oh. Well, you know, we talk about in-ears probably more, almost more than anything else on this. So um, uh, I tried to use, so I bought a new Shure uh, wireless system and it, Happen to ship with uh, some shore um, generic, you yep. know, not U molded universal fit. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, my ears canals must be weird because they always I never have had ones that, that sit well. Uh, they fall out. And so, you know, I kind of struggled with that. And, you know, I, I'm thinking that I want more ambient than what my ears provide. So I have UE sevens with a, with a port. Hang, hang, hang and, on. Uh, we're going to, we're going to see if we can fix the Skypiness of this. So just, just stand tight folks. We will, we will actually be back faster than you notice. All right, we're back. Okay. So you want, uh, you want more ambience. Yeah. I think I want more ambience. And again, I, I, here's the thing. I, I, I am constantly struck by how much better it feels to feel the band. And that isolation factor just never, I'm, I, you know, how many years have you known me fighting this thing? Yeah. And I've had a great mix, you know, on occasion. I still fight with the thing, with the fact that things change over time. And because I'm leading the band, I can't constantly mix myself. But, you know, things get louder over, over the course of the evening. Different things get louder in different ways over the course of an evening. I'm, so, you know, I would I, say overall, they don't work for me. 
Okay, so I have to ask about that because I've been spending a lot of time with different sound engineers um, lately. And one thing that I noticed that really impacts my ears. So the way the way mixing boards work it, in general, I mean, you could have a setup where you actually got, you know, splits pre gain and, and all of that stuff. But but generally you don't. I don't think your band does. My bands don't certainly. Where the way it works is, you know, you plug a, a, a microphone cable or whatever, you plug an input cable into the mixer, you set the gain on that, and that gain affects every send from that channel, right? So it doesn't just affect the, the, the sends to the mains, but it affects the sends to the effects and also the sends to the monitors. So when, when, when you were saying this just now, it reminded me of a thing that I actually had to deal with. Um, with Dave, our, our engineer for Uptown and hit the previous drummer did not use in ears. And so it was not in ears make you w way more hypersensitive to the nuances of your, your monitor mix. Right. I mean, I mean, without yeah. question, cause it's, it's yeah. right there. And, uh, and I, I went up to him after a thing and I said, Hey man, uh, you adjusted the gain on my snare drum. Didn't you? He's like, Oh yeah. He's like, I had to bring it up. He's like, you know, I didn't need right. much of your snare in the mix initially, but then for the, whatever the second set, I needed more. So I brought up the fader. It wasn't enough. I realized we didn't have enough gain on it. And I turned up the gain. I'm like, okay, right. But here's the thing. I have that in my ears and his eyes opened. He's like, Oh, I'm sorry. Ooh. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, he knew, you know, I, he's a really smart guy and he knew he just wasn't thinking about it. And, and so I wonder if Bill is, adjusting gains to get those just right, you know, throughout the gig. And maybe that is impacting what's happening in your ears. Because I'm sure that that is part of it. It is part of it is the actual mix. Right. But part of it is actually things going into microphones and musicians turning themselves up. Sure. Sure. Cause that will, it, well, depending on how that, um, depending on how your, your things are wired, uh, yes, it it can be that that um, that when a musician turns up on stage, it impacts what's sent to the house. It it depends on the it depends on the way it works. But but yeah, that's certainly possible. Yeah. And then, like I said, I'm just used to as soon as I take an in ear out and I kind of literally feel the air moving on stage. Yeah. It's really hard to go back into isolation. It's really really hard. I mean, you feel like you're connected to the live performance and I don't know, I, uh, in the number of times I've had a perfect in-ear mix that I can live with for a whole night, I can count on two hands. I, I generally have gotten to the point where I'm just getting some, I'm just getting, uh, vocals. So a, I can absolutely hear myself sure. and not have to push so hard and can hear a blend for harmonies. Yep. And I'm just having, I'm just having one in, which I know is highly recommended not to do. Right. But <laughs> yeah. 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 Cause and, you'll make you know, that, I mean, a, you're not protecting one ear and then with the other ear, you're going to run that louder than you would if you had both in. So you're actually potentially hurting both ears doing that. And I know, you know that. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah but I, just, I do know. And, yeah. and uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, it, I'm still, after all this time, still fighting the in-ear process. I'm, I'm fighting the change. I'm fighting uh, the comfort zone of actually feeling the band play with the, with the ears out. Um, I don't know. I, like it's I said, I, I was thinking that maybe more ambience would be, would be my answer. So not using a full seal, but, um, I'm still not finding it quite as, quite as effective. I, yeah, I have, uh, you know, I've been doing this with in ears for almost 20 years now, I think. And, and, and I mean, it, it, first of all, I will say that having like, talked with other people and experienced it with other musicians. It is the worst for guitar players. That transition into in-ears is the hardest for a guitar player because you, you learn your instrument. So much of it is hearing how your amp sounds over there, not right yeah. in your ears. Right. And, and so that it, that is a tough thing. And, uh, but even, even as just as a, as a drummer, it took, it took me probably a year, but, but really like three months of fighting every bit of it. Like, nope. At every rehearsal, at every gig, I got both ears in all the time learning how to do that. You know, you got to learn how to sing differently. Actually, you need to learn how to not sing differently. 
Um, because right. The, in, right, the in-ears will make you you'll think. You'll sing you, softer. Yeah, you'll sing softer. It's like, nope, still the same microphone, same PA, same, same loud band around you. You still got to project. Yeah. So, you know, yep. like learning all of that stuff, but then just getting used to the fact that it sounds different. Like there's, there's no way that it's going to sound the same, just softer with in-ears in. It is a different thing. And, and you just have to, I mean, you either come to terms with that and accept it or, or, well, you accept it, whether you then choose to use in-ears or not is sort of the decision that has to be made. And can you get to a point where you can enjoy it with the ears in and be comfortable with the ears in is really the question. But mm -hmm. I will, I will say I've had a lot of different, I mean, I, I, I think I counted, I've had, I think 12 different, um, custom in-ears and then probably another, you know, whatever, 20 different universal fits over the years, just with everything we do with, with Mac observer and all that stuff. I, I get, I test out a lot of earphones and, um, and I have found that the, um, the, the new ones that I have from ultimate, the, the UE 11 uh, pro ambience are remarkably closer to a, live on stage mix than the previous ones that I had, which were the UE seven pro ambience. And it's got an extra, the, the 11s have an extra driver in there. I don't know if, you know, there's something different about the retooling of the, the, the ambient channel or anything like that. But, um, but there's just, I think really what it is, I, I talked to them a little bit and it's just that, you know, they can be with the extra lower end driver in there, they can get the, uh, they can do the crossover in such a way that you get more high end actually happening in your ears. And that's what, you know, that tends to be what you miss is that, that sparkle on the high end, the breath of the stage and, and all of that. And it, it can come in, um, you know, so I've found those, but you know, the problem with that is, you know, now instead of saying, Hey, to learn if in ears work for you, go get a hundred dollars. Yeah. Go yeah. get a hundred dollars set of earphones and try this out see if you like it. And then if you like it, sure, go and spend some money and get some custom filters. Yeah. Now it's like, well, to really know you got to spend a thousand bucks. Yeah. Yep. yep. And that's like, I mean, <laughs> I don't care who you are. A thousand bucks is a lot of money. So, Absolutely. um, so that's, that's where it gets tough. But, um, but the, the, there was a remarkable difference between the seven and, and the 11. Um, and I think it's, it's, the, you know, it's an extra low end driver, that, that lets them, you know, just cross it over differently, but it's, it's a remarkable, remarkable cool. sound. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's like easy for me to say, uh, <laughs> hard to, you know, I understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So uh, anyway, that, that's what, yeah. I, like I said, I, I will touch base with you on this often, and often, and often, you know, Bill spent a lot of time and a lot of attention getting me set. Yep. And then, and then you're right. You know, it's little things like, again, a semi-professional band where if he moves the wrong fader, you know, all of a sudden the mix is off and I'm done with it for the, and then it's out. And then once it's out, it's kind of hard to get it back in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I have, I tend to keep a mixer of some sort, sort of live on stage with me back at the drums, uh, certainly for the first couple of songs. Uh, but it, it's a different thing, right? I have this whole arsenal of things around me. It's not a big deal for me to also have an iPad mini right. kind of tucked in there that I can just reach over even mid song and just, you know, kind of adjust a fader quick. So it, I get that it's different when you're up front and, you know, but I mean, but, you know, how bad would it be to have a, a, a you know, a, a small iPad, an iPhone there? on my amp or something? Maybe not that bad. Or, or just put it on your mic stand right there and just adjust your ears right there. Uh, I mean, it, you know, I fly my mic stand around a lot. Oh, then uh, don't do that. Don't, yeah. 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 That's bad. That's bad. Hey, how many songs does Uptown Celebration have? Um, We probably have about 300 on the list. I would say that, you know, there's there's a hundred and. There's a little over a hundred that are like ready to go at any time. And then the remaining, whatever, you know, hundred plus, um, are, we could, we could make it through them if somebody requested them kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so let, talk me through that. So the sh you've done what, three shows with them, four shows with them. I've done, I think the yesterday or Saturday was my sixth or seventh show with them. And how, how much have the set list for those six shows been similar? Uh, you know, 70% of it's the same every night. And then, and then it changes 60 and to 70%. Yeah. 
how does it work with that 300 song set list? So you're just expected to be familiar with all those in case they get called. He sends out the set list days in advance. And if you have to out in advance. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but like, but audibles happen like the other night he called uh, in the middle of the gig, he called, Hey, ya for, you know, that outcast tune. It was like, Oh, oh yeah. okay. We played that once before we've never rehearsed it, but you have a pretty good retention, right? Like once you play something, it's kind of in there, right? Yeah, I do. But I also have charted all of these things. Uh, 300 songs. Um, the ones that I need to chart. Right. So like, Hey, is weird. Cause it's, it's a five measure free. I mean, now I don't need to chart it, but the charting, it allows me to sit here now at a moment's recall and say, it's a five measure phrase that happens. And the last measure of it is a measure of six. Right. Yeah. And, and so, and it's just that way throughout the song. And then there is a stop uh, like three quarters of the way through the tune on a certain vocal line or whatever. But I just have that marked in my chart. So when he called, Hey, ya in the middle of whatever tune we happen to be playing, it was like, Oh crap. Okay. But I had my iPad right there. And so I just like pulled it up and got it in there. I actually added it to the set list. I had enough, enough time to, to and the guy who uh, owns the band is the musical director on stage. He is. Yeah. So does he do things to help you through stops and stuff like that when he knows he's called something yeah. that it's like likely there's going to be some fogginess on it? Yeah, he doesn't sing at all. So he is always free to kind of be, you know, wherever he needs to be. But but between him, every, I mean, everybody will cue me for the for the most part. We had some moments the other night where our singer got a little, I don't know, he just, he, you know, you lose a little bit of focus. And he was just, it, we were playing Shout. And, uh, you know, the Isu Brothers tune kind of a la the Blues Brothers. And uh, and he he always cues the stops because you never really know where Marty's going to stop. Well, he didn't cue the stops. And it was like, oh, hey, man, remember me? We haven't actually rehearsed together. I just want <laughs> your hand. And he looked at me and he kind of shrugged like, oops, you know, like, I mean, yeah. it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. People were having fun. It, it all worked. But yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I'll get cued or, you know, things like that. For sure. But you also get a couple days in advance notice and it'll call out, hey, you know, we're going to be playing this. So, so, so brush it up. Yeah. Make sure you have it. Yep. Yeah. And again, very, very little and everything is to the record. So there's very like there's not a lot of built in unique things to the songs that your band does. Um, No, there's quite a few segues and transitions that this band has. But, you know, the few rehearsals that we did have, that's what we went through. We're like, OK, you know, this song straight like the record. Do you need to play it? Nope. OK, next yeah. one. Is this you know, this is straight like the record. You need it? Nope. All right. This one, we do this weird thing. We better play it. You know, it's kind of obvious when we got together for rehearsal, which things we actually needed to rehearse. And it's like, do you need to play September? No. But however, you know, September, we transition into we are family. So let's play the last chorus of September and let's let's learn how that time, that tempo change happens and where it happens. Like, yeah, OK, cool. But what's, yeah. what's the most out there unexpected song that that, that band plays? Oh, I don't know that we play any out there unexpected stuff. That's not the point of that band. I right. don't think that's kind of why I asked the question. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I could probably come up with something, but it, it's not going to be that out there. I mean, no fish. No, 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 no. That band wouldn't, wouldn't play fish. That would surprise me if we did that. Yeah. But when we've done, I mean, you know, things wind up getting called. We, we played, uh, uh, Oh, we played some journey song that was, that was, I mean, it was, you know, it, it wasn't a surprise song that yeah. everybody was like, Hey, I've never, who, what band is that? Everybody knew it was a journey song, but it was, you know, it was a song that we'd never played before. It was like, sure, oh, that's sure, interesting. Sure. Okay. You know, but it's fine. I mean, that's not the point of that band. It's just, you know, go out and have fun yeah. and uh, people pay us lots of money and it's fine. And they get but, to but we, we earn it. You know, it's like, it's, it's how it works. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's crazy though. It's crazy. Good right. crazy. So did we, uh, did we, did we solve all your in-ear problems, Paul? <laughs> I'd we talked to. about them. I know. I know. <laughs> we, we discussed them I, again. I wish, I, I wish for everyone, but, but especially for you, cause you're my buddy. I, I wish we could get you to where you could use in-ears and have two in all night, because that's a new thing for me to be able to like consistently every gig be able to do that. Uh, that's just the last like six to eight months with, uh. with these new ears. Yeah. It was always, you know, I'd have to take one out occasionally, especially if I was singing the lead, it was like, Oh no, I can't be in my head for this, you know? <laughs> and, um, and now I can, and I, it's, I just don't, it's, it's blissful, but, but you know, and just because this one set happens to work perfectly for me, doesn't mean that that would be the, the one that works for you either. So 
you know, I, 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 I lead, and I lead it's a expensive to life. To figure it out. Yeah. yeah. I, I was able to kind of, you know, figure this out without it, without it putting me in the poorhouse. So that's, that's a beautiful thing. But, um, but, you know, I will say this because it hasn't all been roses with these, uh, UE 11s. Um, the, the seal wasn't quite right. They've actually been back and forth to ultimate ears three times. And, and I, I will say, and they've been great about it. I mean, totally like, I, I, I lived with it for longer than I should have. They say it's 30 days, you know, or whatever. And they're like, no, no, you know? And so it was like three months. I'm like, I'll pay you to, to fix these. They're like, no, no, like we, we want to get this right. And, and that's just how their customer service is. And I, and, and to be fair, all of the in-ear manufacturers that I've dealt with are the same way. They know they're building a custom product for you. They know that it's uh, entirely possible that what they send you is not going to be perfect for you the first time. And they're ready for that. And frankly, it's built into the profit margin, of their prices, right? They know that some percentage of the people, and it's a significant one, are going to wind up sending things back once or twice just to get it perfect. And, and they want that. So if you do this and you, you know, you go and you, you get your ears molded and you spend the money and, uh, and, and then you get them and you notice things are just not right or, you know, not perfect. Get in touch with the manufacturer, whoever it is, and and walk through that process with them, because th there is a way to get it perfect. And mm. and and it, it like they want that. They're not going to feel like you're putting them out. I've never had any of these companies uh, and I've never heard of anyone having any of these companies say, oh, come on, man, you're, you're, you know, you're being crazy about this. No, that that's the point. Of course, you're being crazy about it. You just spent a grand right. on this on this thing. <laughs> like, it should be right. It's a luxury product in that sense. It's, you know, it's custom built. It absolutely is supposed to be perfect for you. And they get that. Yeah. Um, and and, you know, with ultimate and this, I think is a, a byproduct of Logitech having bought them, which we know Jerry Harvey uh, wishes he could undo, but you know, life is what it is. Uh, <laughs> hey, it, things worked out okay for him, right? Um, they have, I think it's 99 bucks. You can send your ears in anytime out of warranty and they will recondition them. They'll clean them. They'll, if there's a driver that's bad, they'll fix the driver. Uh, all like, 90% of what you'd need done to your ears, including some stuff that might seem major is 99 bucks. You send in the pair and they, and they do that. So this is, this is ultimate ears. Yep. It's a, it's a relatively new thing and uh, it's just a flat rate out of warranty repair. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. It's just pro.ultimateears.com slash support. And, and they'll just get them working again. And I did that with an old, old pair that I had and I sent them in, you know, to get, you, you just go online, you, you pay 99 bucks with your credit card. They give you a, a thing, you ship them to them. And, uh, and, you know, like two weeks later, or even a week later, I, I had them back and it was like all brand new drivers or the new, whatever needed to be new was new. And yeah. yeah. And they clean them up and they, you know, fix it's great. So don't lose sight of that. That, I I haven't seen that from anybody else. And maybe their repair prices are about the same everywhere else, but they're not out there just like saying, here, come get it. Yeah. We, because they want them to be right for you for a long time. So, you know, for them, 99 bucks. Okay, great. We'll just get it. And now we've got happy people using ultimate ears out there. So, yeah, like you said, it's a custom product. It has to be exactly right. Or they're, they're not going to have any customers. Correct. Correct. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah, there's no, there's no two ways about it. Yeah. 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 So, so there you go. All right. Well, that's all I got for today, then. Are we, we covered good? some ground. Yeah, we, we did cover some, some ground. ground. Yeah, man. Well, then it's time to bring the band in and get out of here. Find us. GigGabPodcast.com. Add the slash Facebook to that to go to our... Actually, it's a great group we got on Facebook there. What is it we like to say, Mr. Kent? Always be Always. perfecting your ears. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs>